I am currently a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell, but I'm actually going to spend uh, most of my time talking about work done by myself and others as a graduate student at Harvard University working on bio-inspired robotics. And I'm going to explain a little more about what that means in a minute, but first I want to kind of do a general audience poll. When I say robots, how many of you think of something like this? So something from a movie. You know, the Terminator, Matrix, WALL-E, Star Wars, pick your favorite, Mice Transformers, but um, you know, there's Tons of examples, some of them are good, some of them are evil, most of them can fly and shoot lasers and they have personalities. They're either cute and cuddly or evil and want to destroy humanity, you know, there's a pretty big spectrum. But, so when I talk about robots, this is usually what people think about, but when you look at real life robots, people usually aren't as familiar with them. So again, just a quick poll or show of hands as I mentioned each robot here. Does anybody have a Roomba at home? Do your parents have a Roomba? Or do you know what a Roomba is? So, if you haven't heard of one, it's this little guy in the upper left corner here. It's about the size of a dinner plate, and it's just a, pretty much a vacuum cleaner. It drives around your floor and sucks up dirt. It doesn't fly, it doesn't talk, it doesn't make cute little R2-D2 beefy noises, unfortunately. So not quite as exciting as the stuff on the previous slide. Maybe a little more exciting. Um, has anybody ever heard of a PackBot? Okay, so that's less common. Uh, how about bomb disposal robot? PackBot just happens to be a brand name for one of them, but this is something that's used very commonly by the military and law enforcement. You know, when there's a bomb or some suspicious package or explosive on the side of the road in Afghanistan, the soldiers can then drive that robot up to it from a safe distance away. It's actually made by the same company. I think it's kind of funny that they have a vacuum cleaning division and a bomb disposing robot division, but that works for them, so whatever. Um, and then finally, over on the right here, it's kind of a classic robotic arm. And this isn't really something you might think of as a robot because it's actually bolted to the floor, it doesn't move around. But if you go into a factory and look at an assembly line, this is what you're going to see hundreds or thousands of picking up bolts and individual parts and bolting them onto a car as it moves down the assembly line. So again, compare this to the previous set of pictures, not quite as exciting as what you would expect from movies, but in the real world, what it boils down to is we usually use robots for things that are either boring, so vacuuming, or putting the same bolt in the same place a thousand times a day, or dangerous, so disarming explosives. Um, another good recent events example is after the Fukushima uh, nuclear reactor disaster in Japan, they actually drove these robots into the high radiation zones to look for leaks, because clearly that's not a safe place for a human to go. So what I'm going to cycle back to now is my title, Bio-Inspired Robotics. So this is kind of meshing these two areas of real-world robotics and things that might seem science fiction-y. What we did in the lab at Harvard and what a bunch of other labs are doing around the country is looking to nature for inspiration on how to build robots. Because it turns out that many animals, for example, insects, have had millions and millions of years to evolve to be very good at certain things like flying, for example, with a bee or a fly or a dragonfly, you know, pick an insect. And it turns out that if we want to design a vehicle or a robot that can do the same thing, it actually makes more sense to look at those animals for inspiration than to start from scratch and just start with a blank slate. So this is what I worked on as a graduate student. And so this is a real bee. We're not that good yet. Um, the robot looks like this. But if I hold these two things up, I'm guessing everybody except for those of you who are very close probably cannot tell which one is a robot and which one is a bee. So if you want to find out, you're going to have to come find me at the break because um, I'm not going to pass these around now. But I'm going to kind of quickly walk through the process of designing this robot and actually tie back in to um, the first two talks and the whole failure theme in a little bit. So this is what my advisor did back in 2007 when I started graduate school. He had accomplished this right before I got there. He got this little robot bug that could lift off straight up. But you're probably going to see a couple suspicious things about this video. One, there's some wires dangling off to the side. And then two, there's these two rails going straight up and down. And what they're doing, I'll explain this a little more in a minute, those wires are supplying power, and these two vertical ones are acting like training wheels or guide wires. So this robot, when he first designed it, didn't actually have any steering ability. And if you remove those training wheels or guide wires, this is what happens. So you can see why it needs the training wheels to start. So my job when I showed up in graduate school was to fix this, figure out how we can get this thing to steer. So I redesigned it a little bit and working with a couple other scientists, we got it to be able to lift off in a straight line, but you'll see once it lifts off, actually it might be kind of hard to see in this video, but it's still attached to this tiny little wire supplying power, so when it runs out of room, the wire yanks down on it and it crashes down. And this is where I want to pause and talk about the whole failure theme a little bit. So if you go into 
the folder I have this PowerPoint saved on. This is called takeoff attempt 96.avi. So what do you think happened to me 95 times before that? Right? So when we talk about failure, we don't just mean, oh, you know, I tried, it didn't work once. 95 times this thing, either I set it all up and flicked the power switch and it just sat there, or it exploded in a shower of sparks and I had to build another one, or it lifted off and then crashed on its face after getting up about two centimeters. So specifically in engineering, failure and creativity are actually a really big part of this process. You know, I kind of went into graduate school. Um, I really liked the first video we showed because, um, you know, I went into graduate school thinking that I was a good engineer because I had good grades. You know, and I had good grades in high school, did good on my SATs and good GPA in college. Got to grad school and was not prepared for this at all. So building a robot and not getting it right on the first try. There's no answer in the back of the textbook. There's no, you know, yes, this is right, yes, this is wrong. It was an open-ended problem that nobody had solved before. So I wish I had uh, actually included the blooper reel in the talk because I didn't know about the whole failure theme, but um, you'll have to take my word for it for now. So more recently, this actually happened after I left. Um, and just, again, out of curiosity, this paper got a lot of press a week or so ago. Did anybody see anything about RoboBee in the news? Um, so they actually got it to lift off and hover in place. So it's kind of dangling in space here. It still has the power wire. Um, and this video will explain a little more about what they did. There's still plenty left to do before these things are up actually flying around in the real world. Um, they have all the computing power is not on the robot yet, so it doesn't have a brain. Um, this part of the video is just showing how it can control the two wings independently, and that's actually how it steers. It doesn't have a rudder like an airplane does or anything. I think, okay, here it shows, it only flies in this laboratory environment that has motion capture cameras, actually. So does anybody here play video games? Yes, so this is actually the same technology they use for video games. They'll put little ping pong ball sized markers on humans and then record your motions for whether it's a sports game or an action game where you're swinging a sword or whatever it is. So we're using very, very tiny little reflective markers that track the robot. Those cameras send information to a computer and then that computer controls the robot itself. So the brain isn't actually on the robot yet. And that's because a lot of what we do <coughs> designing these things is just figuring out how to build something this small. So here's the picture of the fly and the little crawling guy that I'll get to later next to a nut, a bolt, and a washer. And one of the questions we get a lot of the time is why don't you just build a tiny airplane or a tiny helicopter? You know, why bother designing an insect? And I hope this picture and this one kind of answer that. So here is the bee next to the tip of the hammer. You can probably imagine what would happen if I took that hammer and tried to use it to put the robot together, right? It's not going to go very well. So we have to figure out what materials to use, what tools to use, and how you're going to power the thing. So this explains why we have that power wire. This is a AA battery. That's the robot. This battery weighs 400 times more than the robot does. So you know, you've probably heard that some insects, like ants, are great at carrying 10 times their own body weight. I think bees can carry one or two times their own body weight in pollen when they're pollinating flowers. 400 times is kind of pushing it. So, there's a lot of research just figuring out how to shrink down batteries and computers. So here's a picture of my little 11-inch Acer laptop, which is sitting up here. Can you guys see the robot in the picture right there? So you can probably figure out that you're not going to run a 100 gigabyte hard drive with Windows and iTunes on this thing, right? So even if you get out your cell phone, you know, I'm assuming most of you have cell phones. Right? Even I didn't get a cell phone until I was a junior in college, by the way, so that makes me feel old. Um, you know, the tiny processor or little SD card that goes in your cell phone, even something that small is too heavy. That is kind of the whole picture of this. It wasn't just me, there's dozens of other people working on this, and failure and getting it wrong is a really big part of that in all engineering. You know, clearly, you have to be a little more careful with pacemakers because you don't want to put something into a uh, live patient and then have it go wrong, so you do a lot of rigorous testing beforehand. With robots, we get a little more leeway um, because if the robot blows up, nobody really cares. But it's not like blows up the robot. So that's what I worked on. I'm going to quickly go through a couple of projects um, done by some other students I worked with. Um, so we also did crawling robots. So again, this is a real cockroach, not a robotic cockroach. Um, but a former colleague of mine, Dr. Andrew Bache, um, designed a scurrying little tabletop robot next to a penny for scale here that can run along pretty frighteningly fast, just like a real cockroach. So if you see it in real time, it might be kind of blurry and you can't really tell. And sorry, this video is kind of dark, but in slow motion there, um, this is slowed down quite a bit. You can see it kind of stirring its legs as it runs along. Um, another former colleague, have you guys ever seen, I think these are giant centipedes from the Amazon or something, so you don't have to worry about finding these here. But um, 
colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Katie Hoffman, actually got the idea for building a centipede robot when she caught one in her apartment one day. Um, not one of these, again, it was one of the smaller house centipedes that we have in the Northeast. Um, but she designed a multi-legged, multi-segmented robot that can run along just like a centipede. So here's a top view of it moving in real time, and then slowed down, you see this kind of wavy body motion. If you ever go look up um, videos of real centipedes on YouTube, it's actually pretty cool. That's how they move their body, does this wavy thing, kind of like a snake, but obviously they have legs. And she got it to do all sorts of cool stuff, like climb over steps. And I thought these were free pebbles, but apparently that's aquarium um, rocks. So walking over rough terrain. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now to um, something that's still bio-inspired, but not necessarily insect-related. So another hot new topic in robotics right now is soft robots. So robots that, instead of being made out of hard metals or plastics, are made out of soft rubber. So I have a little um, example here, and again, you can come talk to me at the table at the break if you want to see any of these up close. And the cool thing about soft robots is that you can do that, and they don't break. So, for example, you can probably guess what's going to happen in this video. The hammer isn't just there for scenery. You can literally build a robot that you can whack with a hammer and it won't break. So, if you took any of the robots I just talked about, the little bug guys, and tapped them with that mallet, or just kind of poked them with your toe, um, they would go crunch and that would be it. The idea here is that you can just keep wailing on this thing and it just keeps going. So I think he really tries to prove the point here. Gives it a second, and there we go. <laughs> keeps going, keeps going. One more, okay, so sometimes when I show this video to little kids, they think that was the robot going to the bathroom. That's not it. Um, it actually has a balloon inside. That's kind of what's giving it the bounciness, and then eventually he hit it hard enough that the balloon popped out the back there. So clearly it's not invincible if you jumped on it or poked it with something sharp, eventually it would break. But the point is, it might be slower than these little bug guys, but it's certainly a lot more resilient in terms of tossing off a building or accidentally stepping on it or something like that. Another cool advantage of soft robots, so this is um, work originally done in the white sides group at Harvard University that uh, the micro-robotics lab I worked in collaborated with them a little bit, is picking things up. So you probably, and again, we talked about learning things as a, a toddler in that first talk. So you probably don't give any thought to picking things up right now. Like you all have your cell phones, there's glasses on the table, a computer mouse, whatever it is. I'll replay this video as I'm talking. That's something that you learn to do as a small child, and then your brain and your hand just kind of take care of it. So like mine grab this kind of funky shape a little quicker. I don't have to think about exactly how far I'm going to move each finger and where I'm going to put it to hold. So that seems simple to us, but it turns out for a robot, that's actually very complicated to do. So if you rewind back to the bidding, uh, beginning and show the picture of that robotic arm that was next to the Roomba and the PacBot, and say that robotic arm just has two metal fingers and I can control the exact distance between those two fingers and I try to pick up a line. If I'm off by half a centimeter, either you're not going to pick the egg up at all or you're going to break it. Right? There's no give in a metal hand. So, the advantage of this soft one is that you can actually inflate it with air. My videos decide not to freeze. And it will wrap around that egg until it meets resistance and then stop without crunching it. So in terms of having robots that are safely going to interact with humans, you know, we've had this dream as a society since the 1950s that one day we'll be like the Jetsons and you're going to have a maid robot that does your dishes and all your chores for you. Um, but you can imagine if you have a metal robot that's you know, throwing dishes around your kitchen and it accidentally turns and whacks you, that's probably not very safe. So there's a big push to start using soft materials to build robots that can interact with humans and mobile robots. So again, this guy probably isn't as fast as the little cockroach and centipede that I showed scurrying across the table, but it's certainly a lot squishier and you could chuck it or drop it or step on it. And there, here it is kind of doing its little wobble before it was away. <laughs> and again, I've just been kind of giving a high level overview here of these robots and not going into a lot of the technical details. So again, you're probably wondering, okay, there's tubes dangling off the robot, isn't that kind of cheating? Yes, so far. So those tubes are supplying air instead of electricity in this case. And eventually they're actually working on a larger version of the robot that has tiny little air compressors on board so it can run 
Um, it's just like putting a battery on the electrical robots to get rid of the wires. Here we need to get compressed air on board from here. It kind of does the limbo. I don't know if you can see it in this video, but there's a glass um, pane right there. So the goal for this project was to build a robot that could wiggle its way under the opening of the door, so like a one-inch opening. So it kind of keeps doing this wavy motion. And then I think eventually it gets through in reverse to doing the regular walk. So this project actually um, was developed by a guy, who, um, Dr. Robert Shepard, who was a postdoc at Harvard while I was a graduate student. And then coincidentally, now he's a professor at Cornell and I'm a postdoc. We didn't know each other at Harvard, but um, at Cornell, I'm working on middle school and high school engineering education and um, looked at this project, being familiar with it from Harvard, and said, you know, kids always really love this project. Is there a way we could actually build these robots in classrooms? So we figured out how to kind of take the information from their publications and convert it to a more school-friendly set of directions. So if any of you guys want to bug your science or your art <coughs> teachers or your parents or whoever for um, funding, you know, these aren't that expensive to do and we have the directions up online. So in terms of creativity and design and you're coming up with your own cool new designs that do some wacky, wavy thing, um, this is a pretty easy project to try out. So. I know that was actually kind of quick, um, but I guess the main point here is that I wanted to just kind of introduce you to a bunch of new technologies that you probably haven't heard of before, and then if you have specific questions about something in detail or you want to know more, um, you can come find me at the break, or for people who are watching this archived online, um, the best things you can do are look up the Harvard Microrobotics Lab, the White Sides Group at Harvard, the Wyss Institute at Harvard, which sponsored a lot of this work, and then finally the Cornell Creative Machines Lab, and they'll have more information about all these projects as well. So, thank you.